Hey everyone. Could we give a massive warm welcome to Jonathan, who's coming to speak to us tonight? As Josh said earlier, Jonathan and his lovely wife Rose and his family lead St. Martin's Church in Hull. They're great friends of our church. And he's going to bring a message to us tonight. So we'd just love to, to pray for Jonathan before he preaches. So if you'd like to stretch your hands towards him. I would just pray, come Holy Spirit. We just pray that you would anoint Jonathan's words today, Lord. That they would bring truth and freedom and life, Lord. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Amen. Amen. Good evening. It's great to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, can I also say thank you for just being who you are? I mean, thank you for being this church. Because you are a blessing to us as the wider church. You're a blessing to the city. So I just want to say thank you. At this time, you may not be aware, but God is really doing something in the city. There is something bubbling up. And God is starting to do something very, very different. I think God is starting to move in this city in a very different way, in the way we've perhaps not seen before. And you're part of it, and actually some of the way that you've been breaking the ground has opened the way for so many others to start to move where the Spirit is going in this city. So thank you. If only... I don't know if you've ever used those words. You go, if only you're driving down the road and there's a really, really nice car in front of you and you go, oh, if only. Obviously, I know you're way too spiritual to have that feeling. Maybe you're driving on your car or you're... Um, in the bus, and you look out, and you see one of those amazing grand designed houses, and you go, Ooh, if only. I was walking past Dot Martin's store yesterday, looking at some fantastic boots, and I'm going, oh, if only. I'm not allowed Dot Martin's, apparently I'm too old now. Do you ever have those moments when you go, if only? Maybe sometimes it's late at night, maybe you're sitting there and it's, you know, early hours in the morning and there's that moment where you're starting to reflect on the things that have happened on the day or happened in the week or have happened in the month or have happened in quite considerable time before and you said, oh, if only, if only I had done such and such a thing. If only they hadn't If only I had not. Do you ever those conversations? I think quite a lot of us have those conversations. To be honest, I think most of us have those conversations more regularly than perhaps we'd like to admit. What do those conversations say to us? What do they reveal about us? How content are we with the things that we have and the life that we have? We're going to read together the last part of Philippians in a moment. Now, most of you may be unfamiliar with how I do things. I do things a little bit differently. So we're actually going to put it on the, the words on the screen, and we're going to read these words out loud together. Is that Okay. I love it when we, the church, actually he not just hear the word, when we all speak the word of God together. So let's all just read this out loud together. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, 
but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Now, so I wrote this letter. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or with empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then travelled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me from Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this is the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings, and all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love Paul's letters. And they're so full of amazing great passages and quotes. And if you've been in church for any length of time, there may be quotes from Paul's letters that we've almost learnt to memorise. I trained as a nurse and I'm, incre- I'm actually very, very dyslexic. And one of the things I had to do was memorise hundreds of drugs and legal stuff and drug interactions. So the, the one I had to do was I, had to, so I wrote them all out on cards. But I thought, if I'm learning all this stuff, why don't I learn a scripture at the same time? So even now, if you say a drug to me, half the time I'll actually start repeating a scripture because I actually put a scripture on the back of every single thing I remembered. And he remembered all of these passages. But there's a problem. Paul is a lawyer. And like every good lawyer, he builds quite complex arguments. He's actually a religious lawyer, and in religious law, it doesn't just cover all things to do with faith, it covers every aspect of life. And like every good lawyer, he builds arguments, one thing leading to the other. So if you ever get a contract, and you actually turn over to page 16, and you focus on one bit, don't because there's all the other stuff that you've got to see to actually get to that point. And that's exactly the same with Paul. He's building argument upon argument, leading us on a distinct journey to come to this point. And now in this really short letter, a letter to really close friends, it's a congregation we forget that he's planted. He knew so well. He's led many of those people to Christ. Now here he is in prison, and one of his friends has undertaken this long and dangerous journey to bring him help, to bring him gifts. But let's be honest, the first part of this passage doesn't really sound that thankful. Yeah, thanks for the gift, I didn't really need it. 
It sort of reminds me of one of those passages you get, or not, those letters you were forced to write as a child. I don't know about you, whenever, you know, when you're forced to buy your parents to sit down and write a letter. Dear Auntie Doris, thank you for the yellow dinosaur socks. Just what I really wanted to wear at work. Is he really saying, yeah, thanks so much for the unwanted cash, guys. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Is that what he's saying? And if they really think carefully. Actually, they've sent him a gift and he hasn't even bothered to say thank you to the very end of the letter. Surely that's the thing you meant to start with. But he's been going on a journey with them to get somewhere. We need to think what that journey is. And this letter, this part of the letter begins with praise. Just as the very beginning of the letter begins. With praise and thanks to God. In Philippians 4 verse 10, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned. Right at the beginning, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. For every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. So there's actually more going on here than just the stuff that's going on. There is this deep praise and deep thanks for the people of God. But then something starts to change in this letter. Where is this praise coming from? Where is this thanks coming from? Where is he? He's in chains in prison. He starts, thank you God for these people. Thank you God for them. Thank you God for this. And right at the end, he's still going, thank you, God, for these people. I had the amazing privilege earlier in the year of taking the funeral for this wonderful old saint in my congregation. I absolutely loved him. He's brilliant. Anybody who loves Jesus and loves word has got to be a good guy in my book, okay? And even though he was really, really ill in the last few months of his life, suffering with quite a significant life-limiting illness that actually caused him a lot of pain, every time I saw him, before I could ask how he was, how are you? How's your family? How's the church? I'm praying I have to say, I've visited a lot of people over the years in the end stages of their life. It's not often you, sit, you go to somebody's sickbed when they're dying and you come out completely uplifted because somebody is praying and they're more interested in you and in the life of the church and praying for people than they're actually interested in their own situation. I was completely humbled. What's happening in his life? What's happening in Paul's life? That here he is in chains, yet he's able to go to praise, yet he's able to go to thanks. Can we go back to his words again? This time we're going to focus on that a little bit from verses 10 to 13. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I, have ever, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. What is the word that unlocks this passage? Have you spotted it? 
It's in verse 11. Content. Contentment. For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. Contentment. Yes, he's saying thank you, but not because he wants more from them. He's saying thank you, but by the way, I am content with what I've got. I am content with everything I have. I am content in whatever situation. Remember who this man is. This is the well-connected, well-educated young man. And that took money. So well-educated, so well-connected that the Jewish leaders asked him to go and hunt down the Christians. He's not the normal guy from the back row of the synagogue. He's well connected, yet here he is the same person sitting in chains. He knows the extremes, yet he has found something amazing. He's found contentment. In complete contrast to his world, and indeed, perhaps even our world, He was content. Contentment in Paul's world was very different from the contentment that he had found. Contentment in his world meant literally to have enough, to be self-sufficient. That is actually what the word content in the Greek means. It means self-sufficient, self-reliant. I am so content because I have so much I don't need anything. I am not at risk. I am so content that I found inner strength to not worry about material things. And there were a lot of people in his time who wanted to do, to do that. There were people searching for serenity. Or modern word, they were looking for inner peace. Is that what Paul's advocating? I have found contentment by complete self-reliance. Is that what he's been talking about for the whole book? Is that where he finishes? Remember, Paul builds brick upon brick, principle upon principle, precept upon precept, until he gets to the end of his journey. Where did this journey begin? With praise and thanks. In chapter one, and that beautiful prayer, I complete your side. Do you ever get stuck what to pray for people? Do, do, do you ever get stuck? Go to Paul and just find the prayers he prays the people. They're called the apostolic prayers, and pray them over people. I used to work in some of the most with some of the most disturbed patients in mental health services. And I used to pray this prayer. May the God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. May the peace of God come into this person. May the peace of God come into that situation. So many times we just saw people (laughs) calming for no apparent reason. He then goes on talking about living for Jesus and being a citizen in the heaven. Then he moves on to having the attitude of Jesus and living as children of light, shining for Jesus. In the Anglican baptism service, when uh, you've got the person just being baptized, and yes, we do do it properly in my church, stick them under the water, and we get them all out, and then we give them a candle, and we actually say, shine for Jesus Shine as a light for Jesus in the world. In chapter three, we then get putting Jesus first and finishing with that amazing section, but pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. 
Is this leading up to self-resilience? Is this leading up to finding inner strength and well-being from some sort of mystic inner peace? No. He is taking us somewhere very different. He is content. Content why? Where's the journey led us? It's all about Jesus. What he has done, who he is now, who he is calling us to be, is all about Jesus. In the old church calendar, there are, there are two key festivals in the year that I do remember to keep. I'm not very good at keeping festivals. The key festival is, one of the key festivals is on the second Friday in September, which is the International Buy Your Pastor or Priest of Beer Day. It's a very important calendar. I suggest you put that in your calendar. Um, but the other key festival is actually the one today. As the year ends and Christmas and Advent is about to begin, a whole day is set aside to remember Jesus as King. Jesus is King. As we're thinking about this point of contentment, Paul is saying, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Serenity, inner peace, self-resilience, the peace of God through Jesus coming and satisfying all that I am and all that I have. Contentment because of knowing who you are. A child of the king. In verse 12 and 13, it says, I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do... I can do what? Everything through Christ who gives me strength. The NIV puts, I have learned the secret of being content. I love it. I was just the secret of living. What's the secret? Where did we start? Where did he take us? Where has he brought us? It's about Jesus. For I can do, or I am strong enough because of everything Christ has done and his strength in me, or that empowers me. Where do we get our strength? Where do we get our strength? When the chips are down, where or to whom do we turn? What is the focus of our lives? What gives us value and gives us purpose? Where do we find peace and contentment? It is not self-sufficiency or reliance. Reliance on. Reliance in. Reliance through. King Jesus, the all-sufficient one. If you know from Ephesians, 
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than I ask or imagine. I can imagine a lot. In my church, I'm always, I've had a mad idea. I go, here he goes again. But to him who is able to do immeasurably more than I ask or imagine. In Colossians 1, this is the Jesus, remember, who is able to do more. This is the Jesus who gives us the strength. This is the Jesus who empowers us. In Colossians 1, verse 15 to 16a, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Through him, God created all things. Who is this Jesus? If through Jesus God was able to create all things, to throw galaxies into space, to knit together the wings of a little tiny butterfly, if God was able to do all of that, how much more is he able to meet us? to support us, to provide for us, to make ways for us, to bring us that sense of peace. How much do we need to find that peace that comes from him? Are you content? Do we have those worries and those fears and those dreams and hopes and aspirations that can sometimes make us a bit restless? Now, this actually can sometimes be a restlessness in the good sense when God is giving you itchy feet, getting ready for that next thing he's doing, but it comes with a sense of peace. Contentment is all about finding who we are in him. Contentment is all about finding our identity in him. Our security in him. I know lots of people want to try and find that through relationships and work and sex and cars and I've not met anyone yet who's found their contentment in those places. Contentment and peace is all about King Jesus and allowing him to rule to reign and that means trusting him to live his way even when it's not easy it's always dangerous when I have a blank page can I ask Are you at peace today? How do those worries and those fears, maybe those hopes that have been disappointing us, maybe those aspirations that have been driving us, but we've not reached where God, we want to get there. Maybe there's things we're doing to try and fill in holes and bits in our identity. That we're actually leaving us a bit empty. Do you need peace? And the contentment of God that comes from the presence of Jesus.
in the very center of it all. <laughs>